it's like summertime watching. You've started watching House, or has this been something oh you've my been God. streaming a lot? I've been meaning to talk to you about this. This is the best. Well, here's the deal. I like listen. I've got an iPod, and I like having something on in the background when I'm working. And uh, for penciling uh, and inking, I-, I need I need a little something. And audiobooks haven't been doing it for me quite so much. Podcasts not it, it is better when I'm driving uh, because I end up I, I actually my mind engages a little bit more in a podcast than an audiobook. But TV is perfect because you can just kind of let it drift in the background. And uh, I, 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 I I'm always on the search for something that's just interesting to be a nice little buzz in the background. Uh, but not too interesting that it's going to distract me, you know. Right. I, I, right. A couple times I tried watching The Tick on uh, on Amazon, and I find I get a little bit too distracted because that's really right up my alley. Uh, but House, which is also on Amazon Prime, this is perfect. There's six seasons of this stuff. It's one-hour episodes, uh, 21 episodes a season, I think. And it's a medical drama, which takes a, it's very clear. Oh, do you remember a bit of Fry and Lori, that, uh, that BBC comedy sure, sketch? Sure. Well, yeah. it's Hugh, it's Hugh Lori, right? It's the same guy, but he's all, you know, he, he's a little skinner and he's got cheekbones and, and, and he's all glowery and handsome. And he, he basically is like it, the, the show asks the question, what if Sherlock Holmes were a doctor? So he's a diagnostician, and he makes all these diagnoses with by saying, "Oh, look! Look at his fingernails. It's clear that he's got stage three lymphoma." You know, it, it, and it's stuff like that. And it, it, it's also very interesting because he's supposed to be so smart, but for an hour he comes up with the wrong <laughs> guesses on all the stuff that's wrong with these people until finally they're on the edge of death, and then he, and then he, you know, the penny drops, and he solves the mystery and it's and it's great and i really like the idea of a medical drama with a sherlock's home a sherlock holmes character as the main character it's really it, i i'm in, i'm into the second season already but it also makes me wish that if we can have a sherlock holmes doctor then that means certainly we could have a lieutenant colombo doctor and that's that's what I want to see. I want to see Dr. Columbo. This is like the smallest Venn diagram ever created for a TV <laughs> show audience. Like, I want to take all the great writing of House, but also combine it with the unique performance of Columbo. <laughs> Dr. 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 Columbo. Dr. Columbo. Dr. Columbo. The yeah, patient. Yeah, yes. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Columbo. The patient is exhibiting blue ears. We've never seen this before. Blue uh, ears. I- Excuse me, sir. I, I couldn't help but notice you've got some nice shoes on. Where do you get a pair of shoes like that? I'm always looking for a pair of shoes that are... Do, 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 do you shine those yourself? Are no, those your no, shoes? No, Dr. Dr. Colombo, for God's sakes, focus, please, sir. The, the patient the patient is exhibiting massive amounts of vomiting. No human body could uh, be oh, vomiting this much. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I just noticed you. Uh, my wife is a really big fan of yours. Uh, could I get your sonograph? I, uh, I I just couldn't help but notice. <laughs> uh, you know, my wife, she always makes the lasagna too spicy. I don't like doctor, the spicy lasagna. Doctor, doctor, for God's sake, Dr. Club with the patient. Beep, the patient is flatlining. The patient oh, is flatlining. Uh, e- excuse me. One more thing. Lupus. <laughs> <laughs> fade to black. Immediate fade to black. <laughs> And then the patient immediately they they give they give him a lumbar punch. Oh, if you ever watch House for any three consecutive episodes, you are going to see at least five lumbar punches in that in that uh, series. They if you ha- you you come into this hospital with a lumbar, they are going to punch it at least once, if not multiple times. They're big on the lumbar punch in, Wait, the uh, l- in like House. Punching the lumbar region of the spine. That's where they draw draw fluids out of your spine. And I think they basically do it just to make you go. Bleh. Oh, geez. Yeah. Lumbar punch. You know why? Because it's physical and dramatic. I did have a yeah. doctor give me an actual punch to the lumbar region. Actually, it was to a kidney. <laughs> when... <laughs> did he really? No, I'm not. I'm actually not joking. I had a kidney fall out of place one time, and he he to test it. One of the things he did was punch me in the kidney. And I was like, ow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hogan. Paging Dr. Hulk Hogan. Dr. Hogan, we have a left testicle that needs a knee brought, a knee dropped on it. Dr. Dr. Hogan, 
We need a Ooh. we need a sky Ooh. high. We, Jimmy Superfly Snooka, could we paging Jimmy Superfly <laughs> Snooka? What you gonna do when cadmium poisoning stomps all over you? <laughs> oh, with the lovely Elizabeth. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can tell this is stage two lymphoma. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, but anyway, that's that's my wish. Well, on that on that very <laughs> comicsy note, Brad, I should say hello to everybody and welcome to Comic Lab, the show not at all about making comics, I guess, <laughs> and not at all about making a living from comics. I'm Brad Geiger, editor of WebComics.com and cartoonist of Evil Link, and I'm his diagnostician friend. Diagnostician, ooh, that's tough to say. Diagnostician friend Dave Kelly, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon, and co-director of Stripped. And this week's Hour of Comics Advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. And Dave, did you see the Ringo Awards announce their nominations? I did see the Ringo Awards, but I wanted like a like an old uh, married couple. I want to put a hand on your shoulder and stop you and remind you that we have a sponsor, Brad, this week to mention. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I, I was the one that was lecturing you on this about 15 minutes ago, and I forgot already. <laughs> we do we do because this is our last uh <laughs> this is the last uh episode we'll have in june and we want to make sure we get this guy in there because he is a very proud uh patreon sponsor and we're thrilled to have him uh the sponsor for today's episode of comic lab is skitter want to hey, hey dave, dave yes do you want to see the world from a bug's eye view no yeah. <laughs> then read Skitter, the humorous comic strip featuring mischievous bugs and a girl named Luna. Visit SkitterComic.com today and see what everyone's buzzing about. Hey oh. So I like how you you varied between pronouncing that skitter and skitter. Mm-hmm. I did well, you gave me a complex about it. Well, no, I didn't I, know I, which way to go. Because I, I tell you what, there's a there's aspects of your Michiganisms that come out, and I think there was a little bit of a uh, a, a hard T there where I would pronounce it skitter. No, but it's, maybe there's sk- <laughs> skitter. Skitter is a completely different comic. It, it's it, it starts in a Fruit of the Loom episode, and and it goes <laughs> from there. No, <laughs> you I, don't want that one. You want skitter, the good one. S K I T T E R. So you take it as a hard T, skitter. And I would skitter. take it as a soft uh, a D as skitter. If I if I'm just talking, I'm, I, I'd probably say skitter like somebody from the UP. But if I'm talking on a podcast and I want to say it in such a way that somebody makes sure that they get the right spelling in their mind, then I'll say skitter. So when you are writing an L E T T E R, how would you pronounce that? It, to you personally, a letter. But if I'm saying it on a podcast and somebody has to get to the URL, it's a letter. Do you see? You see what I'm saying? Oh, I see. So you're saying we should be doing our jobs right, is what you're saying <laughs> in terms of podcasting. Yeah, <laughs> just for once, you know, <laughs> give, give, just to throw these people a curveball, you know, just just give them a little something to so go. So I on. can't. I so you're saying I shouldn't treat the English language like an old soccer ball that I found in, <laughs> under a bush and just give it a bad kick. I can't do that yeah. to the English language. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, treat treat this treat the English language a little bit better than you know Doctor Left Hook gave your kidney. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, once again, I just want to remind everybody: skittercomic.com, skittercomic.com Skitter. is this, and you'll um, see what everyone's buzzing about. Is that is our kind sponsor for this month? So make sure you check that out. And then you yeah. had mentioned the Ringo Awards before. I so kindly Ringos cut, co- unkindly cut you off. Ah, several great uh, people getting nominated for Ringo's. First of all, I do want to say this. I uh, it, It's clear that the people that used to run the Harveys are now running the Ringo's. I, I, I think there's been some, it's safe to say there's been some crossover there, even though I don't know that for a fact. Uh, spiritually, you can see the same spirit. Hopefully, Reed Exposition follows through. They've been saying that they're going to come out with something big for the Harvey Awards. They bought the Harvey Awards, and uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of announcements out of them. Uh, I'm hoping, certainly not a lot last year, and the New York Comic Con is coming up real quick in October, and uh, they're running out of time if they want to have a Harvey Awards this year. But uh, the Ringo Awards is is a really nice way to kind of uh, grab onto that spirit that uh, the Harveys had, and I—I I don't know about you, Dave. I always liked the Harvey Awards. I thought they were fantastic. 
Did you know? I did. I like the Harveys. I, I guess the best way for me to describe it is I was agnostic. Why were you pro Harvey Awards? <sighs> You want to know the truth? Yeah. I had a shot at winning a Harvey. <laughs> I didn't have a shot at winning an Eisner. I, I, I was never going to win an Ignatz, you know. And NCS, I don't think they want they want the time of day for me. But the Harvey, I, that was actually within reach. <laughs> but listen, the Ringo Awards nominated and a lot of really great names there. Uh, a few that are very pertinent, shall I say, to our uh, listeners. Best Comic Stripper Panel, Bloom County, Burke Breathed. Mutts by Patrick McDonnell. Uh, those are both syndicated comics. P. Nizzles. Uh, uh, well, well, no, no, wait a minute. Bloom County's not syndicated, is it? Well, it, it says Andrews McMeal Universal uh, behind it, so I, I, I've huh. got to... I I just I saw that and I assumed syndicated. Is it in paper? I okay. So oh, it's not in papers. Amazing truth. It it only appears on Facebook. Yeah, so that's not syndication. Well, why does Andrews McMeal have their names all over it? Oh, you know what? Hold on. Andrews McMeal is the publishing side of things. That's not the syndicate side of oh. AMU Universal. Well, th- it's going to get more confusing because the next name I'm all g- right. Pearls before swine. Stephen Pastis. Andrews McMeal Universal. Okay, well, that one is syndicated. What the hell's going on? I, I, I'm scared and alone. All right, and, go ahead, keep going. And here's another. And making a threefer for Andrews McMeal Universal, Sarah's Scribbles. A fantastic. Really one of the best ones that come down the pipe in the last few years. I'm, yeah. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. So, okay, Sa- keep going. Sarah's neat. So uh, here, here's what I wanted to get your, your hot take on. Best webcomic, 1000, Sanford Green, found at Webtoons. I Love You, Quim Chi, found at Webtoons. The Middle Age, Steve Conley at middleagecomic.com. Siren's Lament, Instant Miso, found at Webtoons. And War Cry, Dean Haspiel, found at Webtoons. Four out of the five nominees for the Webcomic Ringo Award are found at Webtoons. Dave, your take. (laughs) My hot take, not being familiar with any of the four titles or five titles, that something seems amiss there to me about that. It is. But I don't want to. Well, I don't want to cast aspersions, ah. but it's weird when you see four out of the five nominees, uh, nominations coming from the same place. Yeah. Are the awards administered by Webtoons? Do we know? No, no, I don't. I, I don't think so. I think I, I, I think well, here's the other thing. The one thing that the Ringos, oh, so the Ringos, I think it's pretty safe to say there was a little crossover in, in uh, administration between the Harveys and the Ringos. And one of the things that the Harveys was always getting slammed on was that you could game the Harvey Awards really easily. Like, that's why uh, sure. the story went. I don't know whether it's ever verified, but that supposedly that's how Scrooge McDuck was always nominated for a Harvey because the guy would send around the nomination forms to all of his employees and bingo, there's I, Scrooge I, McDuck. The one year that I went to the Harveys with you, I remember sitting there, it's like, best sci-fi comic, Scrooge McDuck. And you're like, what is going on? Yeah. Best historical fiction, Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> but the Ringo Awards. So uh, I feel like someone might have gamed the system on this one. This seems a little, that seems a little odd to me. I, I don't know any of the titles. They might all be delightful. Here's what I'm going to tell you. What's that? Here's what I'm going to tell you, Dave. Okay. The Ringo Awards built in something to kind of act as a governor on anyone that wanted to game these awards. Like they had a, they had a combination. Okay. It's, it's really neat. They've got a combination of a panel that selects the nominees and popular vote. So they try to. Who's on? Okay. Do we, is it a publicly listed panel? Do we know uh, how the, it might the be? Although it's a little bit late for me to do that research now. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, the short version is like I—I I mean, on on my most human level, I get it. It's hard to administer yeah. a award and make it totally uh, fair, and also to make it welcoming so that people can submit names of the stuff they like. Um, and it may just be Webtoons attracts a very young audience, and maybe they're very easily motivated to go vote for something versus someone who, like, uh, I don't know, the oatmeal that might have an, right, an older audience right. at this point. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of something. You know, so I, I don't know if it's gaming the system so much as like being aware of that there is a Ringo's and then mobilizing your fan base to mm-hmm. go vote for it. That could be also be it. I don't know. Um, 
And on another level, who cares? Well, really? You know, I mean, I'm, who I, cares? You know, I, I didn't see any Brad Geiger on that list, so I care a little bit. But, uh, but us, you know, you know, <laughs> sour grapes aside, they're all. They, if they would have been a bunch of stooges or something, I would have been upset. But I looked at them; they're all great comics. It's not like there's a there's a you know anything to be upset about. I should say this too. Th- this also might be showing my hand and that I might be a super old man and that these all have gigantic audiences yeah. and I'm not familiar with any of them just because I'm old and beat up and behind the times. Uh, so that's also a possibility. To answer your question though, uh, I went to my number one source for news and information, webcomics.com, and it just so happens that the guy that runs that wonderful site had some information. In an effort to thwart the ballot stuffing oh. that has traditionally plagued the Harvey Awards, he's pulling no punches. The majority of their words will have a hybrid nomination process. There will be five nominees. Two will come from an on- online nomination process, and three will be generated by five jurors. So that's what I meant by a hybrid. Oh, okay. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank that editor of webcomics.com. He must be that really guy a handsome is so guy. Good. You great. should hear him do Lieutenant Columbo. He's something else. Yeah, it almost it it didn't at all sound like he was Prussian. I mean, it was it was a great, it was a spot on hey. impersonation. Hey, you want you want it, me to? Don't don't do uh, it again. Don't do it again. But would you like to know the actual professional jury for the night 20, 2018 Ringo Awards? It was Michael Kavanaugh. If it will, if Marty Grosser. Yep. Okay, Marty Grosser, Post. editor of Diamond Comics right, Distribution's right. Uh, previews catalog. I, lo- I love that catalog. I, I look at it every time. Carla Marsh Southern from Heroes Aren't Hard to Find. I'm going to stop doing the Columbo now because I can't maintain it for that long. Rob Thank Stull. God. Oh, our long uh, national nightmare is over. <laughs> Rob Stull, illustrator with uh, credits including Spider-Man Adventure. And Gus Vazquez, illustrator for comic books including Deadpool and X-Force. So, you know, not 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 uh, not a bad group there at all. Yeah. No, that's a perfectly acceptable panel. That's a very esteemed group. Um, all right, well, um, listen, maybe this is just telling me that Webtoons is a much bigger uh, model of quality than I thought it was. I, I Okay, so here's where I have to admit my own uh, naivete to the world. I don't read that many comics anymore. I read maybe three and even them yeah. semi-regularly. Um, in terms of online. So uh, I don't, I mean, I know that Webtoons can pull in some massive numbers for the big hits. Like you had mentioned Sarah Anderson. She does gangbusters work, um, and rightly so. I think her humor is hilarious. Uh, but um, I don't, I'm not that audience. I'm not the audience. You're on Webtoons, though. What am I talking about? So what did, what is Webtoons experience like for you? So just to prove it to myself, uh, whether these sites were good, I, st- I put up Evil Link on both Tepastic and Webtoons and didn't say anything to anybody about it. Just re- uh, relied on their internal discovery and organic reach. Uh, Tepastic, uh, was n- I did not get great results on Tepastic. And then they changed their terms of service and included what I considered to be a, a pretty underhanded rights grab. And I-, I closed things down immediately, shut down my account, and never came back. Uh, I, I'm not saying that you should. I'm just saying that that's when I saw what their terms of service was, I didn't like what was going on there. Webtoons outperformed Tapastic left and right. And again, I didn't, I didn't say to anybody that I was putting stuff over there. And I generated a, a pretty nice readership, a, a, a pretty regular readership that I'm uh, not, not too ashamed of at all. Plus, they, uh, they, they build in so that you can promote Patreon directly from your Webtoons page. Uh, I always put a little ad, uh, strip ad at the bottom of the page. Uh, my, my only takeaway is right now, I don't think I'm doing it right. I don't think you should do it the way I'm doing it. I'm posting a page a week, uh, kind of like, again, I'll, I'll use my own words against me, kind of like a 2005 webcomic who hasn't kept up with the times. Uh, I think now I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> cop to that. I'm guilty. Uh, but I think, uh, it, and, and I'm, I'm actually considering maybe revamping it. What I see working really well on Webtoons is somebody posting like several pages of content in one episode, in one posting. And then you just sc- keep scrolling down and read and read and read and read that I'm seeing. So you yeah, get them hooked yeah. a little and, bit And easier. people like the, I, what, from what I'm, what I think I'm perceiving is that people are liking the longer reads. They like the deeper dives. 
And how does it do from an archive standpoint? Like, is it easy uh, to read to the, can I jump to the first? If I Evil were, Link if on? I were building, it, actually, ironically, if I were building an interface, it would be closest to what Tapastic did, uh, but closer, uh, uh, but, it, but that not be being available, I would make it closest to uh, Webtoons. Uh, I like the way their interface is. You can easily bookmark your place. You can easily see using little thumbnails what page you're on or what uh, arc you're on. Uh, it's it, it's a really good inter- it's It's a really good reading experience. Uh, what they're also saying, this just came out not too long ago on Webtoons, is they're recommending not even posting a page, but by, but posting like almost kind of like what we do on Instagram, Dave, where you post panel by panel in a horizontal scroll, or I'm sorry, in a vertical scroll. So like panel one would be uh, on top, and then panel two would be beneath it, and then panel three, and you just keep going down, not even putting a page up, because they're saying most of the readers are on mobile, and that's how they want to read that comic, is one panel at a time that gives you the biggest uh, surface uh, exposure for that panel, makes it the most readable, one panel at a time, and then just keep scrolling down. So it is then for the Utes. It's for the Utes. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, okay, so um, so you've it, so it's had a nice natural growth with no push on your part. Uh, can yeah. I ask you an inopportune question that you don't have to answer with this Go specific? Right but is there money in it? No, no money at all. I, the only money for me, for me. Now I have heard about people that have kind of landed deals with webtoons, and and they are paying certain people to produce uh, comics. Uh, for me, there's been no money. Uh, they've got a right now they're doing another uh, contest where it's called the Discover Contest where you can win one hundred thousand uh, dollars in prize money. Uh, I, I, I that's another thing where I kind of looked at the terms of service and it, it's one of those things that I I, I think you kind of there's a give and take involved there that isn't right for me, but might be right for somebody else. Right. Uh, but uh but no, there's there's no other than like if I'm getting and I I haven't put I I put the question up maybe a year ago and I it might be time for me to put it up again. Uh, I put the poll up for my Patreon backers. And I said, hey, I just want to know where'd you come from? How'd you find out about this? And uh, at the time, nobody was reporting that they came to me from Webtoons. That may have changed over the last year, so maybe I could make the argument that some of those people discovered me through Webtoons and became a uh, Patreon backer, right? But I I don't have any way of knowing that. Yeah, no, that would be helpful to know. Um, so, so this is actually worthwhile time for me, if you don't mind. There's we have a five dollar question from a patron that actually is super yeah. appropriate for this in general area. Um, Let's so, segue. Yeah, so we'll, well, it's it, we don't even need to segue. It's got to be it's it's right in where we're going here. So on the topic, this is the question on the topic of everything old becoming new again. I've seen a lot of up and coming web comics being syndicated through Go Comics. Given that the web comics model was to go it alone without a syndicate, was this, has this changed in your mind? And if so, what value exists in being syndicated in 2018? So I think the the big one here to to just to clarify is that that is not syndication in the traditional model. Could you right. just clarify, before, Brad, real quick, what syndication meant in the traditional sense? Yeah, but I, I was going to say before we get into this, we have to we have to define our terms. And this isn't one of those things where you know somebody gets all pissy because you said tomato over tomato. This is this is a really important distinction that you have to understand if you're going to discuss this. Syndication is is a very defined thing. What that is is you uh, send your comic to the syndicate. They distribute it uh, to a number of different places. And all of those places pay for your comic to the syndicate. The syndicate takes a cut right. and gives a cut to you. The traditional syndicate was a newspaper syndicate, right? The cartoonist sends it to the send their comic strip to the syndicate. They send it out to newspapers. Every one of those newspapers pay for the comic every week, and the money gets uh, distributed backwards. And and there can be a number of other types of syndicates, but for comics, usually we talk about newspapers, right? 
Right. And I think to, to clarify why that term of syndication is important is because in the traditional analog physical meat space sense, oh, why did I use the word meat space? I hate that <laughs> phrase. Damn it. In the traditional analog or, or old world sense, there was a lot of legwork. Like you had to almost make photocopy prints and then mail those out. And those had to be clipped by editors and those had to be pasted up onto a page. And those, yeah. and then invoices had to be generated and sales had to be follow up on and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in the digital world, it's not the same because what we are is those traditional syndicates are are sort of transmogrifying into being a digital platform, which is a very different thing from being a, a traditional newspaper syndicate. So even though they operate with very often the same officers, same salespeople, same marketing people, they do a very different job when it's on their website versus what they do in the traditional newspaper sense. Don't you think that's a, a oh, good yeah. way to describe that, Brad? Yeah, and it's important to understand that uh, the, 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 that if you're putting your comic, uh, and this is where Go Comics doesn't help, but if you're on Go Comics, you are not syndicated. But there are syndicated comics that are on Go Comics. Right. But just the fact that you're on there doesn't make them a uh, it doesn't mean that you're syndicated. What it means is you are part of more of a collective like keen spot and i'm 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 it, i'm it's killing me i can't think of the name oh here it is you're an aggregate you're a part of an aggregator type site and that's what keen spot and modern tales and all those sites like that was they aggregated they collected a bunch of comics put them all in the same place um mostly aggregator sites are run off of ads and then it goes back to that same old model the aggregator runs the ads they take the money, take a cut for themselves, give a cut to you. Uh, so if you're on Go Comics right now, uh, unless you've got a syndicate contract that extends beyond your comic just appearing on their site, you're not syndicated, you're aggregated. And that's an important distinction. Right. Well, and then Go Comics, I don't, I don't know if Webtoons, you can tell me if they do this, but Go Comics also does a, I think it's a 20-year uh, subscription where you get all the ads removed, you get something more like archives, you get more archives, there's something else you get. Um, but that's the basic idea. So you basically, uh, you're essentially buying a comics magazine in, right. in web form um, with all these different comics, ad free kind of a thing, right? So they do that. But who gets the money from that subscription? Uh, well, uh, go comics, and then it's distributed in whatever contractual way you have contract with them. So I, okay, so now since you were kind enough to say that you're on Webtoons, I should point out that I am on Go Comics with Sheldon and Drive. And for me, it's the way I look at it this, and the way to answer the question for this person is I look at Go Comics as, for me, beer mm -hmm. and pizza money because I run older Sheldon and older Drive. So it's not the newest thing. And if you're already a reader, you don't go there to find the newest, hippest mm -hmm. uh, entry. You know, you um, it's basically for what I would like to think of as an older audience. I think it skews slightly older. I, maybe I'm wrong there, but um, that uh, that are exposed to this wider comic. They like the platform. Clearly, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be using it. So they like to read their peanuts on there and they like to read their Kathy. And oh, look at the, what's this? Sheldon, I'll exactly, try this. Yeah. That kind of thing, right? And so my long game on to being on that is not the direct money that I make, but the potential Patreon sub subscribers down the line or people that come to a comic show having read Sheldon uh, on Go Comics uh, for a couple of years, you know, that kind of thing. So the the follow up answer is has that impacted my business at all? And I my honest answer is in no discernible yeah. way. Um, occasionally I will get those checks that are for you know the old reruns of Sheldon and Drive, and I'll be like, all right, and I'll deposit it, and that's that. But um, it's not for me. It's not a cash cow for me. It's not a career goal for me. It's not a, even a career stepping stone. It's just one more leg under the table to help get book sales and Patreon subscribers. Um, and maybe, Brad, that's what you're using Webtoons for. Is that, a, is that an accurate description of what you're doing with it? Yep, yep. A, a, in other words, I would say that being uh, aggregated on Go Comics has no real value. Uh, neither does Webtoons or Tapastic or any of those others. How, it, no, no outward value. However, uh, I do say, it, so in other words, I wouldn't run out and sign up for any one of these. But... Uh, as opposed to what our advice was during the Web Comics Weekly days, I do think that you should uh, mirror your site uh, on a on a on one or two of these that are that is of your choosing. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you're not putting a lot of work into it, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a ton of work into this uh, into a mirror site. 
uh, but just mirror on a couple of different places just to get a little extended reach that you wouldn't normally have. Uh, but don't put uh, any more time or any hope <laughs> into it. Know that it is exactly what we're describing it as, and that's a mirror site. It's just another place to put your stuff. And as long as it's not taking you more than a couple minutes to upload this stuff and it's not distracting you from doing the real work of web comics, uh, then go ahead and do it. But but I wouldn't run out and say, all these up and coming comics are coming from Go Comics. Uh, I, I, there are there are some, but those are the ones I think that Go Comics are bringing in. And same thing for Webtoons where they're going in, they're signing a contract with uh, somebody and they're they're putting money and uh, development behind those features. Uh, that, it, that, that is the case in, in several of those instances. Uh, but you signing up for a free Go Comics or a free Webtoons site and just uploading it without uh, like a money contract between you and that site, uh, it, it is that does not make you an up and comer. It makes you just like me, somebody mirroring their comic. Yeah. And just to just to put a, a, an underline on how little time you should spend on building your Webtoons or Go Comics audience. Um, you're in my mind, you're putting it on there so it grows your audience. You're not putting any work into it. So you're growing its audience. Um, and I, right. I hope that's uh, that's a helpful distinction is that it's it should be helping you, even if it's a small, minuscule amount, you shouldn't be helping it. So don't waste your Twitter time. Don't waste your your social media or blog feeds or anything like that pointing people towards it. It should be pointing people towards you and your Patreon stuff. But here's how little effort I put into Go Comics. And um, I mean, I love everyone there and I like the platform and it's very nice. And uh but there will be times where I get busy enough and it's so little money in my overall career that I will forget to post. And every once in a while, I'll get an email being like, hey, we're two weeks into June, Dave. Were you going to post to Sheldon? And I'll be like, oh, hey, <laughs> I forgot about that. All right. Yep. That's so that but that gives you a sense of how little emphasis I put on that because it's not the core part of my business. You know, in fact, it's a yeah. minuscule part of my business. If I if I didn't see any check from them this year uh, and granted, I would I will notice it eventually in my bookkeeping, but I'd be like I, it wouldn't make an impact, basically. Um, right. So that's how small the overall money is. Now, there are five or six web comics specifically that I my spidey sense is that they're doing gangbusters on Go Comics. How much money are they making? I don't know. But has it helped lead to publishing contracts with Andrews McMeal and other things? I'm sure it has, you know, because mm -hmm. the publisher on their part, they are wisely using it as a test of platform, or a platform test to see how big your audience is. And if it's X amount of people, well, it's time to turn Sarah Scribbles or Awkward Yeti into a book, you know, that kind of thing. And so- right. Great, right. let's do that. And and more power to them. That's a smart thing for uh, Andrews McMill to be doing. That's it's really wise on their part. Um, but I don't think you should go into it expecting gangbusters or expecting a career. It's as Brad was saying, it's just one more leg under your table propping up your career. Yep. Well, Bradley, we've got a ten dollar question from a Patreon backer. The ten dollar questions are audio questions uh, that are, are our way of saying thank you to people that back patreon.com slash comic lab at the ten dollar level. And here is this week's question. Hey, gentlemen, uh, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts and uh, kind of maybe some of your experience on when you're contracted to illustrate a comic, you know, by a writer or someone else, um, some general safety tips. Obviously, getting paid is the first and most important thing, but um, just anything that you guys have learned or any any cautionary tips for being safe. Thanks. Ah, oh, that's a good question. Well, Bradley J. Geiger, you want to take first crack at that one? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, uh, let's note at the top, neither one of us are lawyers. We're not qualified to give specific legal advice, but I, we've been around the block enough that we can talk about this in generalities, well, right? Well, now, hold on. Speak speak for yourself there, buddy. I've passed the bar in both Kentucky and in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've yet to pass a bar, so you're uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're a, uh, you're a little bit ahead of me. <laughs> That's that was the best follow up on a dumb joke that I've ever had. That was great. I've yet to pass a bar. That's great. Yeah, I watched a lot of Dean Martin growing up. So uh, so let <laughs> so here's 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 a couple things I want to put across to you. Number one. Uh, when I was writing the web comics handbook, I was lucky enough to get Robert Koo to write like a guest, uh, piece for the book. Uh, and, and specifically one of the things I asked him was, uh, how do you read a contract? And he had this really neat method of looking at a contract that I, I still think is, is useful today. Uh, he's, he says it, he calls it the five bucket 
uh, process. He's he he knows that he's got a good understanding of the contract if he fills each of the five buckets. And the five buckets are number one, who's it between? That's the parties. Number two, what each of the folks is getting and for what they're getting it. The legal people call this consideration, okay? Number three, how to get the freak out. That's also called termination. And he didn't say freak. Uh, Number four, what happens if the shit hits the fan? And he did say shit. Uh, This is where one party doesn't do what they're supposed to. That's called a breach, okay? So your contract needs to say, not only what my expectations are for you and what your expectations are for me, but what happens when one of us drops the ball? Because you got a plan for that. You're not saying I expect you to drop the ball. You're saying if you drop the ball or if I drop the ball, what happens next? And finally, fifth bucket, and this is an important one. Really, really pay attention to this fifth bucket. What is the term? How long does this contract cover? Uh, you got to know, is this an ongoing, look out for the word perpetuity. If you see the word perpetuity in a contract, uh, that should, that should be an alert to you. That perpetuity means that this contract goes on forever. Uh, I don't like signing any contracts that go into perpetuity because I don't know what's going to happen, especially on the web. I don't know what's going to happen two years down the road, let alone perpetuity down the road. So I don't like any of this perpetuity. Uh, But if you can look at all those contracts, uh, if you can look at all those buckets and figure out how your contract fills each of those buckets, then you've got a really good way of at least starting to get your head around that. Uh, Don't get at the other thing I'm going to say, and then I want to hear your thoughts on this, Dave. The other thing is don't get all weirded out by legalese. Uh, There's a reason that Uh, contracts are written with legal language. And that's because it's really important to use very narrowly defined words. We'd love to write a contract that says, hey, uh, I'm going to give you some money and you're going to do some work. Well, if you did a contract like that, it's very ambiguous. It doesn't mean a lot. It doesn't mean anything specific. Uh, It leaves a lot to be interpreted. And that's a trouble uh, in, in a legal contract. So they use narrowly defined terms. You'll find that if you stay calm, because it is a little bit off-putting to read a contract, if you stay calm, get yourself acclimated to what the different words mean, and that first paragraph is always going to spell it out, party of the first part, party of the second part, heretofore known as, you know, doofus number one, uh, you can actually follow along with what's going on in that contract. And the main thing for your protection, you want to know, This is the headline. What do I expect out of you? What do you expect out of me? And when the money comes in, how does that money get split up? That's the main thing. What what are your thoughts on this, Dave? So I've got a lot of thoughts. Again, reiterating that Brad and I are not lawyers. Here's some stuff from the trenches that I've sort of gathered over the years, which is that I look at a contract, and maybe this is how lawyers look at contracts too, but I mainly look at contracts as forestalling the worst possible scenario or basically planning for if everything goes wrong, here's what we're going to do, right? Mm Because when you're making a contract, you're starting a project and everybody is smiles and handshakes and love and this is going to be great. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. But it's, it's, think of it in terms of a marriage. Uh, you, no one anticipates five years after going down the wedding aisle that you both hate each other and one of you is throwing a shoe <laughs> with the other one and you're going to yes. a lawyer, right? But with a contract, you're absolutely, because it's entirely business, it's not romance, you're saying, here's what we're going to do if shit really hits the fan. Here's what we're going to do if I don't perform. Here's what we're going to do if you don't perform. Here's what we're going to do if we both don't perform. Here's what we're going to do if an outside party sues us for having performed. Here's, <laughs> Here's you know what, what we mean? can like, do if, if the guy from across the street comes over and performs a little bit too often. <laughs> All right, slow you down a bit. Uh, <laughs> But like, who's liable? Who has ownership? Who's going to pay if we get sued? Who's going to pay if someone falls for while reading our work or, you know, whatever sort of liability you might get from it. So that's the big one that I always think of. And then if you want to look at it in the most positive light, which is also what I do when I look at a contract, I say, here are the basic performance steps. I am going to give you XYZ by June 15th. 
When yeah. I do give you X, Y, Z by June 15th, you have seven days from that date of delivery to pay me X, Y, Z times 10, right? You're that kind of whatever, you know, however you want yeah. to think about it. Um, and so it's basically just laying out, I'm going to do this, then you're going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then you're going to do this, and then the project is done. Et voila, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think of a contract both as preparing for the worst possible uh, outcome and preparing logical, very clearly stated steps of who's going to perform, what they're going to do, who has the rights to it, and uh, avoiding things like Brad said, like perpetuity, first right of refusal, uh, complete ownership, unless they're, and the way, so and then following up on that, uh, if someone wants complete ownership of your work, my attitude is you can have, the more copyright you want to claim, the more you have to pay me or, right. or, or the more points you have to pay me or however you want to look at it. Um, and if you want to give me more rights in general, you have to pay or you can pay me less. Uh, or if it's more of a hassle, you're going to pay me more. The less hassle it is for me, contractually speaking, I'm, you can pay me less. So for me, it's a sliding scale of hassle and, and rights, uh, clawing rights from me, uh, with my pay. And so those kind of seesaw back and forth. And then the other ones that I would look for is, um, basically I always assume that whoever is writing the contract, that contract is going to be written. 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20 in their favor. Mm -hmm. No one ever writes a contract going, <laughs> I, Dave Kellett, want to give Brad my second born. Right. Brad's been great. He's going to get so. <laughs> so uh, I have learned, and it takes a little bit of confidence, that you never just accept the first contract. You look at it no. and you go, hey, um, this third clause, subparagraph two, I want to get rid of that entire thing. And very often they go, okay, why? And you go, well, this, this, and this. And they go, all right, that's fair. And then you get rid of it. Um, more often than not, I have found contracts for art to be templated or um, mm -hmm. one that they have reused for 20 years and no one's looked at it. So that when I point out that subparagraph two of clause three is super egregious, they go, oh yeah, that really is egregious. All right, yeah, we'll get rid of that. <laughs> but and never have I had it, and if it if it is run, don't walk. Never have I had it where raising a point or a question or a, a potential change to a contract ends the job. If yeah. they've gotten to the point where they're presenting you with a contract, they want to work with you. So it's it's a negotiation. It's a conversation at that point. You haven't signed anything. But you have to know that once you have signed, it's locked down. So you can't yeah. go later, hey, I want to change this thing. The the time to change it is before you sign. So negotiate and talk and by all means, hire a lawyer. If there's ever yes. anything important in my life, I try to hire a lawyer because it's worth a couple hundred bucks to, I guess, potentially a couple thousand bucks to have them come in uh, and look at something um, if it's important to me. Dave and I have been friends for almost 20 years now. And you hear this time and time again. I don't need a contract with Tony because Tony and I are cousins. Tony and I are friends. We don't need a contract. I, I believe me, the more friendly you, you are, the more you need a contract because that's a person that you're you, number one, if you value the friendship, uh, you don't want things to go south. And what a contract does is it codifies what the expectations are. Think right. of every, uh, argument you've gotten into, uh, with your spouse, uh, with your best friend, uh, I am willing to, I uh, will, I'm willing to bet my eye teeth that the arguments, the, the worst arguments you've ever gotten into came down to a misunderstanding of expectations. Yes. I expected yep. you to do this and you didn't do it. You expected me to do this and I thought it was on another day. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, that's usually my wife. <laughs> I, I told you to do this and I thought it was tomorrow. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a breakdown of, of expectations. That contract is there to spell those expectations out in very distinct language. So if you're working with, when Dave and I started uh, Comic Lab, what's the first thing we did? We went over, grabbed uh, uh, Katie Lane's services, and we said, Katie, uh, we want to do this thing. Uh, here's a few things that we want the contract to cover. Dave and I uh, had a contract done before we started episode number one. In fact, I think we had the contract done a couple months before we did. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were still working on technical stuff long after we, uh, yeah. And so, Dave and I are friends. I like Dave. Uh, but yeah. th that doesn't mean that I was going to, in fact, that made it more important that I had a contract well, with yeah, him. Well, yeah, and the audience needs to know this. I like Brad. I love Brad. But I don't trust Brad to save my <laughs> life. That <laughs> son of a bitch you. will cut you just as he'll Nor say hello to you. should you. you. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but here's the thing though. Like Brad said, it's about it's it's about expectations because I'm trying to think. Friends have breakdowns. Friends yeah. have moments of crisis in their life. Friends yeah. have expectations that were just not communicated. Friends have a changing mood. Friends are also human beings and things can go wrong between human beings. So mm. a contract basically says, look, these are our expectations for each other. We have both agree. We've looked this over. We read it through a few times and I'm signing my name to it saying, I agree and I'm honor bound to these expectations. Yeah. And on, on its basic level, it's actually just a very decent human thing to do to, to make a contract between friends. Mm -hmm. um, but... One thing that I will will f I always forewarn younger cartoonists that as you get better, you're going to be approached by the smaller publishing houses, mm -hmm. the not DC, not Marvel, not Image comic houses, and just know the the publicly shared knowledge from all established cartoonists is that their contracts are terrible. Yeah, and are, should you sign them? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer to say. I sure would have a lawyer look at them. I know the one time I ever signed one, I crossed out like X, eight clauses on the contract. Um, <laughs> why, are you, why are you laughing? Oh, because oh, you know I, that story. Yeah. But uh, so anyway, as you're a younger cartoonist, they I don't want to say that it's almost, I mean, it is kind of intentional that they're taking advantage of cartoonists in their 20s and 30s mm -hmm. and giving them a templated contract where all rights are to the company and very few are to the artists. Um, and so it's just a question for you to work out on your own mind if, if companies like that are worth working for for a short amount of time and taking your lumps and then building your career a little bit. Um, and I, I, we, Brad and I have talked about this at length, but I can see arguments for and against doing it. So um, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying just be wary that those are kind of universally acknowledged to be bad contracts. Um, and then for contracts that are like work for hire freelance, um, you're going to see all sorts of, you know, it'll run the gamut. And one thing that I've, I think I've said this to Brad, is that the further you move away from comics in your freelance work, the higher the pay will be, yeah. <laughs> is, is the general move. So if you, if you go from a freelance job for comics versus a freelance job for publishing, going to be better money there already. If you yeah. go into advertising, oh boy, that money gets so much better. If you go into TV production or whatever, movie production, oh my God, the money gets so much better drawing for that. Like the... The further you get away from comics, uh, just because there's not a lot of money in comics is the truth of it. Um, and so uh, other industries like advertising is swimming in cash and publishing in general has a comparatively lar much larger uh, pot of money than comics do. So um, I, I've been going too long, Brad. What are your thoughts? What Any, any uh, add-ons to that? It's, it's, so when I teach uh, entrepreneurship uh, at, at the college level, I have an entire uh, lecture on on contracts. And what I found that is, is really good to go through, if we have a little bit of time, is just a couple of contract terms that I want you to understand really well. Uh, for example, uh, understanding exclusive rights and, and, and everything that you're going to be looking at uh, as a, from the standpoint of a creator is about the use. What are the different uses? What are the different rights uh, to that created work? Exclusive rights means that the person who is paying for it can use this art and nobody else can. Non-exclusive rights means that the person's paying for it, but you can turn around and sell that to someone else because it's a non-exclusive contract. Now, a lot of times in a, in a non-exclusive contract, the uh, the client is going to say, okay, I'm going to use it in this one instance. Nobody else can use it there. But then, for example, I could sell a cartoon to the Philadelphia Daily News, and they would have uh, exclusive rights to print production. But then they might not, they might have a non exclusive use towards uh, digital production. So I can take that same cartoon and put it up someplace else on the web and get paid for it, and I'm within the contract. So understanding what exclusivity means in a contract is something that tends to confuse a lot of people. And uh, I, I, oh, here's one that people always get confused about, warranty of indemnification. Basically, all that means is a lot of syllables. It just means that you're assuring that the thing that you're creating, you have the copyright to. That you're not stealing it from someone. You're not ripping off somebody else's design and passing it off as it is. Right. And what you and the way to think of that, too, is, you know, every, every six months you hear a cartoonist online going, this T-shirt company ripped me off. And and what the T-shirt company will turn around and say is, 
the I, the artist that we hired had signed a warranty of indemnification that they had produced that art. It's not our fault. And, you know, then it's a yelling match online. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes the T-shirt company hired somebody and that person had basically ripped off a cartoonist. Uh, and sometimes the T-shirt company had ripped off the cartoonist. But that's what yeah. Brad's getting at in terms of you're signing something saying, I produced this, I have the copyright, and I'm transferring the copyright to you. Yeah. And as always, just to put a, a little uh, bow on this conversation, if you have any questions whatsoever, this is the one time in your life you don't want to cheap out. I am I'm the king of cheap. I can I can uh, argue along with you uh, for cheaping out on a number of different ways and finding the low cost alternative everywhere you look. Uh, when it comes to a legal contract, this is when you want to be a, a, a little bit of a spender. You you want to get a qualified lawyer who has a background in entertainment law, particularly uh, that can look at this and understand ever, all the ramifications down the road. This is where you yep. want to spend some money. Yep. And uh, this also, this conversation uh, reminds me and probably reminds you that we need to have our friend and lawyer, Katie Lane, on the show yeah. to clarify all the mistakes that we have just made in the last five minutes of, of talking oh, about I'm this. Oh, sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure she's going to, if she ever listens to this, she's going to say, okay, I've got a list. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I've got a few all thoughts. Right, all right, lads, pass that microphone over here and just go quiet for about 10 <laughs> and minutes. You got, uh, yeah, just sit on your hands. I will say one thing that I will clarify or, or not clarify, I will underline something that Brad just said, which mm -hmm. is that you want someone who works as an IP attorney or a copyright attorney or a, a, a media or entertainment attorney. If you have a cousin's uncle's brother's friend who Ugh. works in real estate law or uh, um, is a trust lawyer um, or you know what I mean? Like something, some other field of law and like, yeah, I'll look at that contract for you. I, yeah. You can, I mean, maybe in the early in your career and you don't have a lot of money, maybe good do, let it happen once or twice, but Eventually, you're going to want to pay for a lawyer in the right field to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I agree it's 100%. Just, it's just not worth having that cousin's brother's friend's uncle look at it just because he happens to be um, a corporate lawyer specializing in HR. You know, like that's not what you want in this case. So, yeah. Anyway. I agree. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a good enough place to button that up until we get our dear friend Katie Lane on here to, uh, to speak the truth on, on contracts from, from a lawyer's point of view. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Dave, we've got time for maybe one more topic. Do you want to tackle something from the I, I, uh, $5 Patreon? I want to tackle Patreon? the topic and tackle our friendship, Brad. How about that? <laughs> yes, our contractually ironclad friendship. <laughs> uh, I can't so get out, guys. I signed it in perpetuity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's got to be my friend for another two years with, uh, so with Brad, time off Brad, for good behavior. So Brad set the expectation that I would be a good friend. What he did not realize is I can't meet that expectation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we that's another bucket all into itself. So here's something. I, uh, this is not from our $5 uh, Patreon. This is something I wanted to talk to you about. I follow a lot of comics that I see on social media and stuff. Uh, uh, and... and there's something that I've noticed that I think we need to talk about, and that is autobiographical comics. And I'm seeing this happen in, in, in a few different instances. Uh, I want to talk about the best way to do an autobiographical comic, because what I'm seeing is people are confusing an autobiographical comic with an entry in their personal diary. Right. So when you have your personal diary out, if you have one at the end of the night, you uh, sit down, you write, dear diary. First, I went to the grocery store and then I went to the gas station and then I played PlayStation for a couple hours and I didn't win. And then I read a book and then mom said it was time to come to dinner and then I went to bed. And an autobiographical comic is based on your life, but you've got to take those moments from your life and do storytelling with them. I'll give you an example. I read one not too long ago, where I, I, it was a seven-panel comic, and for six panels, the guy talked about football, what he liked, what he didn't like mostly about football, didn't like this team, didn't like that team, uh, didn't watch the game last night, didn't miss it at all, blah, blah, blah. Panel seven, uh, the phone rings, he answers it, and then he looks into the camera and says, oh, they just released my mom from the hospital, they're sending her to a nursing home. End of comic. And it's like, stop, hold on, hold on. <laughs> slow down just a minute uh your 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 autobio comic doesn't have to, it, it shouldn't be the things that happened to you that day 
Instead, you should take the moments out, out of today and a few moments from yesterday and a few moments from when you were five years old, maybe, and make a narrative out of it. Tell a story. That, that, that thing about not liking certain things about football would have been a very good comic if you could have arrived at a certain place with it and said something interesting about maybe how your uh, views changed on football or what football represents in this country or something like that. Make make a point. Uh, but, to, but to give me six panels of football talk and then say your mom's in a nursing home, you just, you, you just, it, you're, it's almost like, uh, Dave, have you ever been at a dinner party where somebody's trying to tell a joke and they can't? Uh, yes, that's most of my childhood. Yes. <laughs> and they're like, uh, these two guys go to the bar and it wasn't two guys. It was three guys. There's these three guys, uh, a Catholic priest, a nun. No, no, hold on. He, it, it was a priest and a minister and a rabbi. And they go in and, and this person stumbles through the joke and it takes five minutes to get to the punchline. And when they get to the punchline, clearly they, they forgot what the punchline was. And they yeah, just, the key word is missing. Yeah, yeah. And and it just comes to a crashing halt and you and you stand there going, How do I how do I get to the other side of the room? <laughs> how do I get how do I get out of this dinner party with this guy sitting here talking at me? Uh you've got to be better than that if you if you're putting this into a comic. You've got to take those moments from your life and weave it into something meaningful. It's gotta be more than just an accounting of today's events. What do you think, Dave? What what advice would you give to somebody doing an autobio comic? So you had brought this up um, in a few weeks ago uh, when and you were reading a couple of different autobio uh, comics and you had shared your frustration with me. And I laughed and shared the frustration with you as well at the time. But now that I'm hearing you describe it, um, uh, sometimes I get this way where I want to be contrarian to what you said. I'm, not that I want to, but I just, I'm seeing. So I forgot to include an anti-contrarian clause. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you made a, mistake, a fatal error, Brad Geiger. I shall always be the contrarian. No clause can stop me in a contract. Um, no. So I. Uh, so here's my thought: is that if you want to make an entertaining or a commercially successful or viable autobio comic, I think Brad's right on target. There's a certain level of storytelling, even in autobio comics, a certain level of presentation, a certain level of artistic competence that requires a, a way of doing it um, that will make it more enjoyable to digest as you go and make it more easily understood as you go, will make it more of an art form and less as a weird diary entry as you go, mm -hmm. right? So I think all of what you said is true. So let me, let me start with that because I agree with you that um, if you're trying to make a more artistically or, or more commercially successful um, story out of autobiocomics, I think that's true, that all, all of Brad's points are true. But as you were saying it, I started thinking of less commercially viable art forms that are nevertheless enjoyable like for me occasionally. Um, I'm thinking of poetry and I'm thinking of collage. And neither one of those, boy, they, they, it's not, no one goes to a cocktail party going, wow, what a great Ferrari you pulled up in. What do you do? Oh, I'm a collagist. I, I, uh, I work that's in where the Papier money is. Mache. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, I, that's I, the I, person that's going to pronounce Papier Mache. <laughs> pa Papier Mache. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mostly write uh, tone poems. That's what I do. I'm a tone poet. And, uh, so that and a lot of spoken word and uh, you know what I mean? There are forms yeah. of art where what I'm getting at is if you want to do an autobio comic that's commercially successful, Brad is absolutely on point, right? Like you've got to, you've still got to work within certain conventions of storytelling to make it both digestible, enjoyable, free flowing, um, uh, make sense with a structure, with an arc, all that sort of stuff, right? But there is a world, Brad, where if I present you a picture of lips and a picture of a bee and a picture of a spoon your mind makes the jump to honey, right? And that's the basic idea with collage is like to create a mood from otherwise disjointed pieces. And so I can think almost in an R. Crumb style of someone doing collage-like comics that creates a mood of a very different life from mine that I might get enjoyment from in terms of reading. But would I commercially support it? Probably not. I mean, it's not like I'm going to reread it. But so, you know what I mean? Sometimes you get like a little slice of life where you're like, wow, what a different life that person leads from the one I do. I'm glad that they showed all those moments in their day in their autobio comic. Uh, that was really illuminating on a very different life lived. Um, but 
again, I don't know how commercially successful that's ever going to be. I'm not, right. I, I, American Splendor did a little bit of that. R. Crumb did a little bit of that with success. I'm trying to think of other people that did autobio comics with some success. Can you think of other people? Buh. Yeah, you you had me at American Splendor. <laughs> well, wait a minute. James Kochalka, uh, didn't he do a, an autobio comic? Yeah. Oh, yes. There's another one. And so, yeah. and and I, I should say the big caveat, I don't know if th- any three of those made a huge chunk of money. I know R. Crumb bought that beautiful estate in France just off his notebook. So <laughs> that's that's possible. Um, but um, in general, I think Brad is on point that that to get back to your original idea, Brad, that you can't you can't just make it a diary if you want it to be a truly compelling comic on its own and not just as a diary. Is that a good summary of what you were trying yeah. to say, Brad? Yeah, well, and and maybe to to take it from the other angle, if you are doing uh, uh, this diary that uh, com- skews closer to David's collage and poetry and, and uh, tone poems, uh, you can't be surprised that it isn't taking off and it doesn't have a higher readership and, and doesn't have a following because you are doing something that is, by definition, going to have a lot fewer people that are going to be interested in what you're doing because most people, I think we have to, we have to start with the assumption that most people, when they read a comic, uh, want, want to have something happen by the time they get to the last panel. They want a story there or or either a gag or, uh, uh, something whimsical or something thoughtful or something interesting. They want to have something, they want to be told a story. And if if you're avoiding that, uh, or if you're ignoring that, then yeah, you're going to have a lot of readers that uh, are going to be less interested in what you're doing. But like Dave said, you still will have some people that will say, "Okay, I get that. That's 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 a mood, and I'm I'm into that." Right. Like artistically, I think even you at your grumpiest would be like, "All right, I get it." Artistically speaking, they're going for a slice of life and moments. Right. Right. Um. No, 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 I don't. I wasn't taking that as a shot. I guess it was a shot, but uh, even you, oh. Brad, the oldest man alive, the grumpiest old man alive, could see the value of art for art's sake. The two thousand um, year old cartoonist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you I, know what it is. Okay, so can I admit a failing on my part? Go Every ahead. once in a while, like comicsreporter.com or some site will link to some beautiful piece of art that clearly the cartoonist spent weeks on. Yeah. But it is art for art's sake, um, yeah. right? As a story, there is no yeah. commercial value there. And I, I've reached a certain point of no return in my own career that maybe I won't snap out of until I'm retired, where I I can't just produce art for art's sake anymore. I have to always be thinking like, all right, but how do I make a living with this? You know what I mean? Right. Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to back you off because you said commercial value a couple of times and, and I've kind of uh, like bristled a, a little bit every time. Uh, let's let's not call it because what happens is you get in. If you keep saying commercial value, you get into that mindset that if somebody's successful, then they're a sellout and they're not an artist and stuff. They're, they're just commercial. They're just interested in, in the dollars and cents. Let's let's back away from that a little bit. Let me give you a, a new way of, of trying on to see if this fits. It, 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 it has narrative value. And I think with narr- things that have uh, a, a clear narrative value, have that element of storytelling, those happen to be more c- uh, commercially viable. But it, it's not about the dollars and cents. It's about the storytelling ap- asset, <laughs> about the storytelling aspect. And whereas that art for art's sake kind of comic is certainly beautiful, it, it, where it falls apart is in the narrative, in the storytelling. Yeah, I you've, so I, I to me, I just thought of a uh, an autobio comic that I don't know why my mind didn't immediately spring on this because it's one of the most successful comics of all time and will continue to be, and that's Mouse. Um, mm-hmm. That's autobio, isn't it? Uh, Doesn't it start with him talking with his grandfather? Yes, yes. In in, in other words, in, in in the fact that it's pulled from his family's history, yes. But actually, that is exactly what I'm talking about. It is well, not that's what a straight I was up at. The, yeah. the narrative value and the artistic value of the way he told it. Um, it has everything to do with great storytelling, but springboarding off autobio. You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent there. So I am trying to think who else does autobio. Uh, Raina Talgemeier does autobio a lot with her comics. God, those are delightful. Have you read Raina's books? They're really, really delightful. They're really good. Yeah. Uh, 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 Funhouse. 
Uh, oh yeah, Funhouse. Look at us. Look at the two old yeah. men remembering look, all look, of comics look that how exist. The, once the blood starts to circulate a few times, I see I, Grandpa I, I just jump needs right to slap his leg a few times and he can stand right <laughs> up again. Look at that. <laughs> and I can the tell you if it's gonna knee. rain. <laughs> oh, the Grandpa's Grandpa's moving around and look, he's remembering comics that he's read. Oh, look at Grandpa. He's doing so good. Oh, Grandpa. Grandpa, would you like some lemonade? Oh, he's back down in the chair. He's yeah, back down, down in the chair. Down. Yeah, get his drool cup. He'll be okay. One other thing before we before we bring it home. I've wanted to say this for a while, and maybe <laughs> I need you to talk me off the ledge, is that I kind oh. of a little bit maybe want to start a third comic. Oh, wait a minute. How, stop the presses. Uh, this is this is uh this is an entire episode. Uh, what I, do you well, want What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Because it's springboarding off of this direct conversation. So I'm going <gasps> to by God, I'm going to plow right ahead. Really? I, Please. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you what it is. I like you always made fun of Autobio Comics. Yeah. Because it, uh, so many like and I want to say 90% of Autobio Comics when you're in your 20s is Oh, my relationships are hard. People are difficult. Oh, <laughs> I had I a rough summer. I don't. I, I don't want to get a job. It's like the same ten stories, right? And yeah. you're like, come on, Autobio Comics, do better. Yeah. And um, so I I got real bored of them real quick in in my twenties, and I kind of never looked back. But now, as I get older, I kind of want to do an Autobio comic. What's fascinating to me about that is that you're usually of the two of us. I am the one who is a little bit more open about my family you don't talk yeah. about your family quite as much so how would well, that here, work okay so yeah here's the uh, uh, we can probably and part of that it. is because your your kids are younger when i when my kids were younger i held back a lot more too but so some of that is just where you are but is is that something that is going to be a conflict with an autobio comic perhaps but um in my mind it's funny you should mention that because the the that was already a settled issue in my mind because the autobio uh, comic that i would like to do is going to be 60% me and 40% me and my wife and that was basically going to be it oh interesting um, but uh but so i it's funny because a, a, a part of it is um, is a is in a, a battle as an artist of whether a you live an interesting enough life and then b whether anyone would ever give a shit about it, right? Like so that's that's the sort of com competing uh, <laughs> phrases for autobio comics, and then I guess c is how how artfully could you create it? Um, and uh, I don't know. The older I get, the more I'm like, that nah, it'd be kind of fun to do an autobio comic. Just for I I think it's it is more for art for art's sake. And as I get older. So maybe Brad, I'm finally letting the hair down as it's falling out. I'm finally letting the hair down. I I don't I here's the deal. I think what you're gonna find is that you're gonna you're gonna sway right back towards narrative and and you're gonna like it. And I'll tell you what I mean. When I was doing fables back when I was working for the Daily News, I did that all the time. And 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 it was because somebody would say, I've got a really good story. And they'd tell me their story, and inevitably they had a really good first act. They had a really good, and it maybe had a little bit of a button. It had a little bit of a, 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 a culmination, but it wasn't a story yet. And so I would take their story and I would find the meaning in it. And I would take somebody's first date where they go on a carriage ride through uh, the old city and they find out that Ben Franklin started the first fire department and the whole gig was, if your house was on fire, you had to negotiate with the firefighters on the spot how much it was going to cost to put your house out. <laughs> right, and I always loved that. the negotiations would go into extra innings and uh, your house would burn down. Right. But you'd save a lot of money. But, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> but see, just like I just did there, all right? That's, that's the story, right? Or that, that's the narrative. It, it, the, it, they had a really good story where it's right up to the point where Ben Franklin... Uh, would charge people. And then that little part I put in at the end where I said, sometimes your house would burn down and you'd save a lot of money. That's the narrative. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? So what you, if you were to do this, I think my prediction is that you would take a slice of today and you'd say, oh man, I, 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 I feel really good about today because I cooked dinner and, uh, you know, it's so hard to get everything to come out at the same time. And then you'd tell that little narrative. And then in the last two or three panels, you would say what that means, or you would give it significance, or you'd say, you know, cooking and dinner is kind of like life, ba 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 ba. You know what I right. mean? And, and right. come out and 
tie it all up. I, knowing you as I do, I, I, I don't think you could ever do an art for art's sake comic. I think you, but I think you'd do a great autobio comic because you would take this moment and display it, and then in the last panel, give it relevance, and that's what stories no, I, are all about. Okay, I, I appreciate your. You have a greater sense of confidence in me than I do. So that th- a thank you for that. But uh, I want to put it in music terms, in the sense that um, you know how sometimes you want to listen to great American jazz from the 20s and 30s, uh, just because the improvisation, the the power, the the uh, the mastery of the of of as musicians that they were. And then sometimes you want to listen to Mozart because you want to think you want to listen to a concerto that's perfectly crafted, you know that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And then sometimes you put on Korean K-pop because you just want something bubblegum, right? And so <laughs> for me, in my own career right now, like Drive is the super crafted comic. Like that's the yeah. Mozart one. That's the one where I'm like, I'm really planning it out. Every little every little uh, winch and a bigger gear is turning, all that sort of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, Sheldon is more the improvisational, just like, hey, I'm making it up as I go, but I'm a pretty good cartoonist and I'm, I'm, it's, we're having fun on a day-to-day basis. And I think for me, my autobio comic, I would like to do it more like K-pop, just like fun. Look at it, what a big idiot Dave is. Oh, another stupid thing I did today. That's great. <laughs> and so maybe I need, if I'm if it's going to be K-pop, my version of what K-pop is, maybe I just need to do it very sketchily so it's quick and easy and I didn't spend a lot of time on it. But And, I, and people I, understand that it is what it is. Yeah, like I think the main theme of the comic would be what an idiot Dave is, and um, uh, it would just be... Ah, don't turn yourself into Homer Simpson. You're not an idiot. No, I'm not an idiot, but it's fun to have an intelligent person doing dumb things because it's the nature of being a human being, you know? It is nice that you can laugh at yourself, yes. Yeah, now. yeah. It- like now. my, I, I guess in the much like my marriage, my wife would be the wise one going, like, "What are you doing, you moron? Don't, don't get off that ladder. Don't, not with a saw in your hand. That's stupid. What are you doing?" Um, and so, but listen, am I going to do this? Probably not. But I will oh. admit that as the years go on, I'm a little bit tempted to do this autobio comic. David, David, David. Yes, you're gonna do it. I want you to do it, and I want it to be a Patreon exclusive. I want you to do this comic and I want it to be a hundred percent behind the Patreon paywall. I want you to do an exclusive and this is your exclusive. Oh, Bradley J. Geiger. David, David, this is your exclusive. PA. <laughs> oh. I, in fact, I invoke a challenge. I challenge you to do this. Oh, you SOB. Don't challenge me to do it. Now <laughs> okay, I, I won't it. challenge you, but uh, I'd love to see you do it. I'm going to think about it, though, as yeah. an exclusive. Yeah. Oh, Bradley J. What a great thing to put at an upper level that you want to drive people like from the $2 to $5, the $5 to $10. And and all you've got to do is do it on a semi-regular basis, it, it, it maybe once a week, once every two weeks, and see what the reaction is. You can always do it more frequently. Here's the Here's the thing, though. Is that like like I was just saying a minute ago? My mind immediately clicks into how do I make a how do I make this worth my time of drawing that comic, the two hours that I would spend on it, or an hour yeah. and a half or whatever. Yeah, I I don't know that I could get enough money out of that to make that worthwhile versus drawing a page of Drive or a Sheldon or something. You know. Well, I'm going to say two things. Number one, I've I, I've seen you work, and I know you can work fairly fast. And if you do a, a, an even sketchier version, take a look at take a look at what well, Sarah's uh, scribbles is a really good example, right? She works in a very very minimalist style. Uh, you could you could do a style that's very much like that. That's and it's all about the writing. It's all about the the meaning, and uh, so you could get that maybe in under two hours. And number two, obviously. Uh, this is either going to be collected into a book or uh, you can use these to sprinkle throughout a Sheldon collection as little, um, what do you call those, little corner illustrations, little indicia, uh, yeah, illumination type deals, right? Where, right. You, where you spice up uh, a page by having this little thing down in the corner. Yeah, I mean, my solution thus far to doing this is that every 10th uh, Sheldon has been an autobio comic in the last few years. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've just I've been sprinkling myself more and more into Sheldon. I do notice uh, that you show up a lot. Yeah, yeah, uh, with varying waistlines in the comic. I always think that's funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I do. I'm gonna t- I'm gonna th- I'm gonna have a good think about this, gang. Yeah, 
Brad Geiger has laid down the gauntlet or thrown down the gauntlet. <laughs> and I uh, laid down the gauntlet's a very different thing. Can you imagine like yeah. taking off a glove and laying it down? You're like, that's, yeah, so here lay, we go. Laying down you. the gauntlet, that's 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 a uh, metaphor for being passive aggressive, I think. I'm, I, he <laughs> laid down the gauntlet. Could you imagine the 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 chutzpah on this guy laying down his gauntlet left and right? So slowly Throwing peeling down off. the gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. Throwing down the gauntlet is aggressive. Laying down the gauntlet is passive aggressive. Or it's a guy that really doesn't want to fight, so he's like, "I'll just, I'll just lay this here on the table." I'll just, yes. I'll just... So, uh, have I, have I laid down the gauntlet now? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't really want to fight you, but I do feel like my honor has been impugned, so I have to lay down the gauntlet gently. <laughs> That's like, it's like a Woody Allen scene. I'll, I'll, I'll just put this over here. I, 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 I've oh, got oh, a perfect stop. place what for you, a gauntlet. You, no, oh God, that's, what is that? That's a, that's a beautiful Woody Allen. Are you oh, kidding God. me? Woody Allen post stroke. What was that? That was. I'll, I'll, I'll put this over here. Oh God, Brad! Oh. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a revised version of our contract that says you can't do Woody Allen anymore. <laughs> but I can still do Columbo. Uh, okay, I'm gonna put two moo clauses in the contract: Columbo and <laughs> Woody Allen. <laughs> you know what I got to say to that? You know what I got to say to that? I got this I to bet say I to do. you. Uh, you've been listening to Comic Lab, the show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and cartoonist of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And Dave Kellett, co-director of Stripped and cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions at www.woodsong.media. Comic Lab is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that twice. Patreon.com slash comic lab. <laughs>